Okay, so this video is really to just take you through the workflow of what to do when you get magnetic data in order to come out with the final product of a basic model of your data. So we are going to be using some data in the Karoo in South Africa. It's a sedimentary basin, so you wouldn't expect much of a magnetic signal, but it was intruded by dolerite sills and dikes, and these um, show up very strongly on the magnetics, as you'll see soon. So what you would do first, you'd open up Oasis Montage, which is the software developed by Geosoft. You'd click on New Project. Um, I like to have a GSF folder on my computer where I just put all the different folders I'm working on. And so here I've got tutorial data sets, I've called it tutorial one. Um, I'm just going to write over my existing um, file because I've created it earlier. So give it a name, GPF is the extension for a GSF project, click save. I'm just going to say replace. And you can see it starts loading up all of the menus. Okay, and so um, this is your screen here, up at the top of your menus, down on the left here is it's your data column, and when we load in databases, grids, and maps, it loads it under these headings and you can go and find them. And so I've got two CSV files of data, and I'm sure often when you get data in the field, it's a text file or an ASCII file, so we're going to bring it into a database. So you go database, import, ASCII, we do that again a bit slower, so database, import, ASCII. And first thing you're going to do is not find the file, but first thing is to create the name of your new database. If you want to see where it's saving it, you click on the three dots. It's going to save it over here in your folder that you created your project. I like to give my database name the same name as the file I'm importing so that I know what file all the data originally comes from. You can see I did this earlier, my computer crashed, so I've already got the database. You would just type it in down here. You don't have to type GDB, GSoft will add that to you. Click Save. Mine just says it's going to overwrite it. Maximum lines, 200 is the default. It should be fine for your database. If you click OK and you get an error saying you need to resize your database and make it bigger, it means that 200 is too small. You can use 500 or 1000, see what works. Channels are literally the columns in your database. 50 should be fine, but again, if you get an error, you can come back and increase it. So click OK. File to import, we're now going to find the CSV file. You can see over here, I've got Karoo 2, Red 2, Red. I just reduced the original database. And I'm going to click Open. Import template. So the computer needs to know what columns to import, what the headings are. And so if it's blank, um, you can always give it a name, otherwise leave it blank and uh, Geosoft will put in a name for you. Append means you've kind of already got a database and you want to add this info to it. Uh, I found during the training that this created some problems um, because if you Geosoft by default put an existing template in, you appended it and you had different coordinate systems or different column names, it gave issues. So I would say try keep it at replace unless you know what you're doing and you really do want to append the data to it. So click replace, click on create template. So here it's just telling you different file types. I usually leave it on delimited. Most important thing to look at here, it says start import on row 2. So it's going to start from here, which is good because we've, the first row is the headers. If you've got tons of comment lines, you're going to have to change this to whenever your data actually, which row it actually starts on. I'm going to click next. Here it's picked up, it's a CSV file, um, otherwise it will pick up other options and if it's not picking it up you can always define here what is delimiting your columns. Is it a space, a comma, a semicolon, um, that's a bit unusual but you could define it here. So click next and then this is the most important part where you actually define what are your different data columns. Now if you're lucky and you've got a column that's got L here is for line, these are the line numbers. It's ideal for Aramag data because now you can click over here, click on line, and this won't import the column. It will literally divide up um, your data into different sheets, and it's a, according to each line. You'll see what I mean now. Um, I already had headers for all my columns, so you can see Geosoft has picked it up and assigned it. If not, and you don't have columns in the original CSV, you have to go here and... Um, actually put in headers over here by channel names. It will not let you import it unless there are header names. Also don't have a duplicate name, so don't have two column X's. Um, you've got to have slightly different 
uh, header name. So micro levels, I'm um, so sorry, raw mag is the original mag, micro level, they actually leveled the data because there were issues, longitude, latitude, eTopo is the to, um, elevation data from the eTopo data set, which I think got a resolution of about 90 meters. Flight height, um, so you can see here is about 100 different here, so they were flying 100 meters above the topography as a draped survey. There's X UTM 34, Y UTM 34, and you can see here this micro level underscore reduce micro level underscore reduce to I by accident didn't delete some columns. I was trying to, like I told you, reduce the data set, and that's why there's multiple columns. So we'll just quickly delete them now. So we're going to click finished, and it's going to import it all into the database. It might take some time if your database is big. Okay, and you can see here it's given a template. So like I said before, be careful because sometimes it can just load in old templates here um, and so you don't want to append to it, you want to replace, so let's click OK. If you don't and you keep append, one of the things we found is then it will come up with a blank database. So if you see that's the problem, come back, click replace, give a new name to your template so it's not picking up the old templates and click OK. And you can see here it's loaded in your data, so I'm quickly going to just delete this micro level co um, column, you can see it's not letting me delete it, it's grayed out and that's because these columns are protected. You can see here protected is tick, so click on protect none and they go away, there were little black arrows in the top, if you right click it doesn't say protected now. And I'm going to delete this column, click yes and I'm actually going to go here and this one was also not important so I'm going to land up with this micro level reduced to. Okay, and so here's your data, and like I told you, it's, this is not all the data, this is line 6200, and if I right click here, I go to list, this shows me all my lines, the L stand for lines, T stands for tie lines, so these are at 90 degrees to help you with just take, checking the quality of your data and possibly labeling your data. Okay, so the tie lines help with checking the quality of your data and also leveling your data. And so the first thing you would want to do is you would want to define what your coordinate channels are um, and what coordinate system. So let's pretend for the moment I don't have this X UTM, Y UTM. Let's use the lat long and actually try to convert our own UTM values. So what you go is coordinates and go... Um, First, uh, if you just want to use lat long, you would go to the second option that said coordinate systems, and here I'm going to say my X channel is longitude, Y channel is latitude, and I click on coordinate system here, and I define what coordinate system is, and as soon as I click OK, you can see it puts a blue X and a blue Y in the columns, and so that we know now that these are X and Y channels. But now if I want to convert, um, I could have avoided that step and just gone here to new projected coordinate system, so because I've told it what X and Y, it automatically picks it up here. So these are my current X and Y. I click Next. It asks me what coordinate system, and it's defined as geographic. You would have to define that if you hadn't followed the previous step. And now what do we want the new X values to be? So I'm going to say here UTM, well, X UTM 34 and Y UTM 34. And now this isn't considered to be the same heading as this column because here I've got an underscore and a capital so it does take those into account you, like I said before you can't have the same heading names in a database I click next and now I want to define the coordinate system so I want to go WGS84 and then it's a projected coordinate system because it's UTM and you scroll down and we go to UTM 34 south and click OK and you can see at the end of my database here it's added them, but there's two stars. So it's not that something's gone wrong, it's just you need to expand it. There's lots of decimal places, and now you can see the values. How to take away the decimals? If you Okay, you'd right click, go to edit, and change the decimal places, you could change it to two. Uh, you might want to make it a bit more. Let's do it to three. You can see here they, the values have become almost, sorry, constant. So three, and then OK. You can see the variation now. And click here and go Edit, Decimals 3. Something else, if you want, is on your lat long columns, if you right click on the heading, go Edit. OK, so if you want to change from decimal degrees here, you just click on Normal and go down to Geographic, click OK, and expand it. And you can see here it's degrees, minutes, seconds, and then a lot of decimal places, which again you can go and reduce. 
Okay, let's do that with latitude. Okay, and let's just double check we did everything correctly. Okay, and you can see that the new XY coordinates we've calculated are similar, are exactly the same as the ones I calculated previously. So let's just delete the duplicate column. Okay, and so the next step, let's make a distance column. So we're going to, we needed to convert from that long to meters, because you can't calculate a distance column from that long, which is in degrees. You need a meters column. So how we do that is database tools, channel tools, make a distance channel. Here you choose your X and Y channels. They must be the meters one, so UTM. You don't have to choose Z and then output a distance channel. You can just leave the default name here is dist, or you can call it distance, click OK, and you can see the values come out, and then you can see here there's a sample spacing across the line of about 70 meters. Okay, and then the next thing we're going to calculate, just so that we do everything we need to in the database, is calculate the IGRF channel. And so IGRF is the International Geomagnetic Reference Frame, and it takes into account the fact that when you're measuring magnetics, you're not just measuring the magnetic field in the body that you're interested in, but you're also measuring the whole Earth's magnetic field. And that's why we get these big values here for our micro-leveled or final magnetic data of 28,000, because that takes into account the whole Earth's magnetic field. So we need to reduce that down to smaller values that just look at the anomalies in the crust. So how you do that is you go Settings, Run GX, click on the three dots, you can click on I on your keyboard and it comes to IGRF. Click OK. OK, and so there's two things, IGRF and DGRF. We're going to deal with IGRF. You can keep the model year as auto. Survey date, I can admit I don't actually know the exact date of the survey. It was somewhere between 1970 and 1980, so we're just going to put 1980-0101. But... Um, Let's see, so if we go 1980-01-01, then we've got our longitude and our latitude channel, elevation, we've got an e-topo channel here, and then output channels you are going to name, so physically type them in. I call the TA for total field, ink, and deck. And if you click OK, um, nothing really happens, so you have to click in a blank column, right-click, go to list, and there's TF, right-click, go to ink, and right click, go to deck. And so you can see the total field, so the Earth's field in South Africa is about 28,500. Inclination is the angle that the field lines are coming in or out of the Earth. And in the southern hemisphere, the field lines come out of the Earth. Um, they come out and then go up and around and in in the northern hemisphere. So our inclination is minus, it's around minus 66, 65. Declination is the angle between true north and magnetic north, and so ours is about minus 23. So now that we've got um, these values, we can actually calculate what you could think of as, as a residual value. So it's um, this total field minus the magnetic field you measured, and it gives us a value of the magnetic field due to shallow bodies. And so how you would do that is you would go database tools, channel maps, And you're going to give it a name, so you can call it residual. Say so insert. I'm going to insert two variables. The first one is going to be this TF. The second variable, I'm going to define it as my micro level. So that's what I measured on the ground. And you can see it's put the variables here, but it doesn't have any symbols. So between the two, I'm going to put a minus. If you needed to, you could click on this drop-down menu, and here's a minus as well. But you can just type it in on your keyboard and click OK. And you can see it's given us a smaller column here. Let's see what it looks like. We can actually see what all three columns look like relative to each other. So this is the total field. Let's right-click on the heading and go down to Show Profile. And you can see here it's, it's a linear curve. It changes a bit at the end here, going from 28,590 up to 664. Let's see what it is that we measured on the Earth's surface due to this field plus the field due to shallow bodies. Click on the micro-leveled, right-click, show profile. You can see it's a hang of a lot more detail because it's due to these shallower bodies. 
and then this residual, let's right click and show profile, you can see it's taken out this curve, this increase from the bottom to the top and flattened it out a bit. So we actually had this problem earlier, it actually creates a negative and if it's creating a negative and not a positive you need to go back here to channel math and swap around which values you're minusing from each other. So here I've said TF minus micro leveled um, I actually need it to be the other way around and I take that out and let's see if it becomes positive okay and that's much better so you can see the main thing that happened there is that this residual that I calculated instead of having this positive this broad positive it suddenly became a negative so I had minus the wrong ones from each other so now that I've, I've swapped it around you can see there's still this positive um, though you can see it shifted up a little bit it shifted it slightly the short wavelength anomalies are the same but it has had the shift okay so let's we're going to actually grid um, using this residual value. Let's see what our x's and y's are still that long. I want to grid um, with x and y. So I'm going to go coordinates, oh, sorry, coordinates, set x, y, z coordinates. And I'm going to change it here to x, utm, y, utm, click OK. And you can see now my blue x and blue y have moved to the utm values. And now I'm going to create a grid of my residuals. So I'm going to go grid and image, gridding, Minimum curvatures, there's different types of gridding here, sorry, that you can choose from. I usually just stick to the first one, minimum curvature. It asks you which channel do you want to grid. I want to grid the residual channel. Where do you want to save it? You can if you want to click on three dots or you can just type in. Um, I like to give my grid names the name of the channel I've um, gridded so I know where the data comes from. If you wanted to, you could even say residual karoo to underscore reduced to. This is just if you've got multiple databases and you're not sure where you gridded this from. And click save. It's asking you for the grid cell size. So I know that the flight line spacing was a thousand. Um, and I'll show you now, now how you could go calculate it if you weren't sure. But since, um, since you guys don't know, let's keep it as a blank. GSoft will use a default value and we'll come back and regrid it now with a new value. So you can click OK. And it's going to output a grid for us. And here's our grid. You can see this broad pink anomaly in the middle is probably what we're seeing on the database here. Let me put these side by side. I go window, vertical. You can see here, if I click on my database, it shows me where I am on the screen here. Let's actually take this data and plot it on top so you can see exactly where the data was collected. How you do that? You go map tools, line path. At this point, GSL says to you, look, I can't plot this data on a grid. I have to plot it on a map. Do you want to convert this grid to a map? And you click yes. It gives you a name. You're welcome to change it. I'm actually going to change it. I'm going to call my map Karoo 2. And the reason being that I'm going to use this as my map that I load all my grids into. So to keep it being called residual is not clever because I'm also going to drag elevation data into here and other ones. So now I'm just giving it a general name, map Karoo 2. It calculates the scale for you, and you can click OK. OK, and now it's asking you what is the thickness of the lines you want to plot for this data. I just leave it as a default and click OK. And you can see it's given, oh, sorry, let's put them side by side. It's given you the grid here. If you want to zoom in so it fills the extent of the map, you click on this Earth button that says Zoom to Full Extent. And so, as we showed before, you can move along your database and click on your plot here and it will show you where you are on your grid. Another great feature is this little button here on your grid that's called data linking. If you click on it in your grid and click somewhere on the grid, you can see in the database it's actually changed the line number. On this side here we were at like line 6000, I think we were 600, um, 6600, I could be wrong. But now that I'm clicking over here, it's jumping over to 9,500. And so it's just an easy way to move around your database. And you can see here, this broad anomaly is this big, this broad long wavelength anomaly is this big pink anomaly. And this is actually the BT magnetic anomaly in South Africa. And on top of it, we've got these smaller, shorter wavelength anomalies. And these are actually due to the sills and dikes that intruded the Karoo. So they're called the Karoo dolerites. 
and they're not too easy to see but it's these smaller splotches on the map. You'll see them easier when we do the filtered data just now. And so the next step is let's create a base map. And so that's just putting nice coordinates around your map so it looks pretty. So how you do that, you go map tools. Um, if you've got multiple maps open, click on the map you want to create a base map for. So it's selected, go map tools, base map, draw base map. You don't have to change too much here except this inside data margin. It's the gap that it leaves between your grid and the outside boundary. Um, from experience, just with this data set, I know 0 0.5 is too small to include the line number. So I'm going to make it 2. Next. If you want to plot your, plot your map in meters, you can leave everything here as is. If you want, you can also come here if you want to define how often it displays your grid spacing, like around the borders of your map, you can give a value here, but we're going to leave it as default at the moment. Maybe you want to put 100,000 meters, 10,000 meters. If you want to display your map in lat long, and maybe I'll do both examples, you would come here and click on lat long annotation, you'd click on edge ticks or solid lines or dotted lines, so it actually, instead of showing meters around your boundary, it shows in lat long. Um, and here you would actually give uh, units that it would display, I mean increments that it would display. But let's leave it in UTM for the moment, we'll come back and do it again now. Click next. If you want to give a, a title for your map you can write it here. Click finished. And you can see here it's given coordinates around the boundary of your map. And you can see as well it's actually got line numbers for each of the lines displayed. If you want to move around on your map, click this hand button and you can literally drag, drag left to right. It goes away once you let go though, so you have to click and click and click. Or just click on P on your keyboard and it appears and it lets you drag from left to right. Um, that's great with your base map. Um, maybe your coordinates are a bit small for your liking. So what you're going to do is click on this tab for Map Manager. It's always going to go away and come back. If you want it to stay there, you click on this pin button. And you can see here coordinates is what it's just added with the, the coordinates around the border. And so click on it here and you can see it's selected in your map. Go onto the selected area, go right click, edit vector group, right click, select all, again right click, text attributes, and you can change the size here. I'm going to change it to 3.5 and click OK. And you can see they're a bit bigger. Maybe let's even do it bigger and say 5. OK. You might say, oh, well, now they're too merged together, they're too close together, the numbers. You could go back here, go Map Tools, New Base. Um, let's just see how often, if we want to get rid of this middle number, let's do it every 10,000 meters. At the moment, it's doing it every 5,000 meters. So go Map Tools, map, Base Map, Draw, Base Map. Click Next, and here you can do 10,000. Click Next, click Finished. And you can see it's put it less often. Um, we would have to change the size again. Let's just see if we can actually change the size in here. Um, line thickness, no, not that I can see. Okay, you'd have to go back here, go edit. Uh, coordinates is already selected. I went right click, edit vector, right click, select all, right click text, and I made it five. Okay, and so I've got coordinates around my map. Um, next thing to do is to actually plot the map that it really jumps out at you. And how you do that is by doing sun shading. And it just applies a shadow which makes the data pop out. And how you do that is you go grid and image, display on map, grid. Select your grid that you want to use. Go down here, click apply shadow. We also want to add a color bar and click on the current map. And this is asking you about your color bar. It's always good to do a title, so let's call it Magnetics. And I always put the units, Nano Tesla. Under More, I'm going to take away the decimal points. I'm going to make it zero. I'm going to make my text size a bit bigger. We had five for the boundary. Let's try five here. And then you can click on Locate to where you want to put it on the map. So click. It's given a value now on your map where it's going to put it, and you click OK. And you can see it's put it on the right hand side. Sometimes when you click on it, it, it lets you select it and drag it. If it doesn't, you just go onto the left hand side here under base and click on color bar. You can see there's also a scale bar and a north arrow. 
either click on them here or on the left hand side, click and drag to wherever you want to put it and the scale bar. My scale bar is a bit small so I'm also going to change the size, right click edit, right click select all, right click text attributes, changing it to 5. Remember when you it's a bit mushed together now don't change the left right size because that's going to change your actual scale bar. Just drag it up and make a bit of space. Um, I'm going to take out the scale value. I'll just click on it and click delete on my keyboard. You, set, um, you can see here there's a bit of overlap between these values. So I'm also going to delete that value and click over here. Your choice. You can play around with your scale bar. Just don't drag it left and right because that will change the size. Color bar in Geosoft is usually non-linear. And what I mean by that is if you go here and your data um, heading, this AGG is your actual magnetic data. If you double click on it, it shows you the color bar. So this is the different colors. This is the actual data. So what data values you can see at the bottom here, here it goes from, let's just try and click out of the area. It goes from minus 260 up to about 21 are the actual data values. So data values of minus 260 are going to be blue. Data values of 21 are going to be pink. And you can see it's not a linear curve, it's um, exponential. So that means that a lot of these values up here are going to be pink, and so it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So you might then think there's a lot of anomalies in your area, but actually it's just how the color bar is displayed. If you want to make it linear, how you do that is you make sure you can see the min and max values, so minus 260 and 21. You go click on this line over here, I'm going to change it to, I'll make it minus 261 and 21. You have to put in a counter interval if you want a regularly spaced color bar over here. This is quite a small difference, so I don't want to put 5, I'm just going to put a contour interval of 1. Usually it's going to give me an error message so I don't panic. So it's telling me the numbers I've given aren't sufficient, which is fine. GSoft automatically adjusts it. You click OK. You can see now it's given you this linear scale. And you most importantly here, you've lost a lot of the pink. So on the previous color scale, a lot more data values were made pink, whereas now it's a one-to-one -one ratio of data number to color, and that's a bit better. You can even adjust your numbers here because I've gone from the bottom to the top, but you can see there's arms on the side here where there really isn't much data. This is the amount of data points that have this data value. So you could actually just start from over here which is minus 230 and go up to here which is minus 11. So I'm skipping out these top and bottom values because I'm kind of wasting colors on those values because there's not many data points there. So let's see 230 and minus 11. It might not be worth it. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, and that's a bit better, better. All that's really changed now is because there's no real data values here about the high values that were being assigned pink and the low values that were being assigned blue, on the previous map, if I put the back arrow, sorry, um, the one after this one, it didn't have many pink and blue values. Whereas now, by clipping out those bottom and top values, we're getting a better spread of colors. It's a very difficult concept, it took me a while to get used to. So yeah, shout if you don't understand this. Click OK. So yeah, there are your, uh, sorry, there, there is your magnetic map. Okay, and I got a bit sidetracked there, creating my base map. But um, the next step is for us to actually just look at what is the line spacing so we can regrid our grid at a reasonable grid spacing. And so it's, it's not rocket science. We're literally just going to click on this magnifying glass with a block above it. I'm going to draw a block on my screen. It creates a block, but it doesn't zoom in straight away. You've got to click again. And you can see it zooms in. Now I want to tell what is the distance between these lines. So I'm going to right click, go measure distance. And you can see if I click on that line and drag to the next one, in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, it shows a distance of 815. And you can right click and go done. And then if you want to do it again, you could go over here and you could drag across, and that's close to 1000. And so I know the line spacing for this was about 1000. You can see it's quite variable. Sorry. It's quite variable across the survey. And so if you're not sure what your line spacing is in the area, look, it's going to be to the closest 100 at least. Um, 
And so you can try to get a multiple range of values. If they really are quite variable from anything from um, 700 to 800 to 900, then you know actually it's to the nearest thousand. So this was a thousand meters. Okay, and so it's actually better now to regrid this grid taking into account this line spacing. And what that is, you take line spacing divided by 4 gives you 250, and that's a good spacing for your grid. Anything um, higher values than that, you're going to get a lower resolution grid than is necessary for the data you have. If you create a smaller station spacing, you, um, you've got, you'll start seeing the gaps between the lines here. So let's try that again. So you would go grid and image. I just want to see if I go display on map and grid, can I put in a value here? Okay, you can't put in a value here, and the reason being that this actually just uses already created grid. So sorry, click off there, go grid and image, gridding, minimum curvature. And so the, again, this is my residual grid. I'm going to leave it with the same name. I'm just going to write over the old one. And this grid cell size, I'm going to put in 250. I'm going to click OK. It's going to overwrite it. There it is on the right hand side. You can see I've still got some gaps and it's because you'll see in these areas, if I put this map side by side, if I click on these blobs and drag across to where it is, there's actually sometimes the lines don't reach all the way. You can see this line down here goes halfway and doesn't go all the way up. So I could either then regrid it at a bigger spacing, but then other areas where I've got decent resolution, it's decreasing the resolution. Or I can go here to gridding and regrid a grid, I think it is. Okay, so I'm going to put the input grid is this one I've just created. Output grid, you can click on the dots or just type it in. Um, I'm going to call it residual Karoo red 2. I like to always add on to my name so I know what the heck I've done to my grid. And this I'm going to say, actually I'm going to say interpolate. Um, and this one it says new cell size. Do we want to change our cell size? No, we're happy with 250. Um, do we want to pad it around the edges of the grid? Do we want a low pass, a high pass filter? I want to go down here and look at maximum gap to interpolate. So if there's a gap in my data, how big must it be before this uh, GSR interpolates? And I've played around this before. I think it was around 500, but you can literally go and measure this spacing, how big it is, and put it over here. Let's see if it works. Okay, some of them are gone. We've still got some. You could go back and go regrid a grid. Let's try 600. You just don't want to do too much because you obviously it's interpolation. It's not real data. And that's why we must plot where we got the data on top. Um, no, that didn't help too much. Oh, sorry, gridding. Regrid a grid. I'm going to jump up to 800. <clears throat> okay, that's filled a lot of the gaps except that one at the top. So I'm okay with that for now. You're welcome to make it more. And so I'm going to take this grid and display it on my map in that nice color shaded style. So you go grid and image, display a map, grid. I'm going to choose the interpolated one, leaving this sh um, shadow and I'm going to have to do a new color bar and I'm going to put on the current map. And again, this is asking me about my color bar. So just make sure your correct late data layer is selected. So this is the interp one. It's got a title got a location, taken away the decimals, I've got a bigger font size and let's see if, how it looks. So let's take away the original magnetics, I'm also going to tick off the original residual over here. I'm going to drag this across and again you would have to make a linear color scale. So what did we say, it went from about 250 to 16 but remember there's not much date on the edge here so it would be from about minus 220 about minus 20. And I'm doing a small contour interval because there's not much space along the way. The GSR gives me an error, but it's put a linear association between the values, the data values, um, and the colors that it's the map to. Great, so there's our um, residual magnetics. You can see every time it replots it, it moves the color bar, so I should probably just change the location of it. So let's do the same with our elevation data. So we're going to go grid and image, gridding, minimum curvature. I'm going to find my eTopo data, and I'm going to give it a new name, eTopo. And I'm going to use the same grid spacing because they collected the eTopo data along the lines. I click OK. And we should just quickly regrid it. 
Me topo. I'm even going to put you interpolate. How much did I interpolate? And click OK. Hopefully it's sufficient. Not too bad. And let's put it on our map over here. So your map tools, sorry, grid and image, display on map grid. And I'm going to select my eTopo interp. And I also want to do a color bar, so I'm going to plot on the current map. Um, don't forget it's not magnetic, so change the title and the units are meters. I'm going to locate this again so that I don't have to keep clicking on it. I think it's the bottom left corner, I could be wrong. No, it's obviously the bottom right corner that it plots it on. Okay, and so there's our um, topography data. There's the color bar. Again, you can double click if you want to give it a linear association. So this is going from 420 to about 1650. 420 to 1650. I'm going to give it a spacing of 5 because it's quite a large difference. Click OK. It gives me an error. OK. And it's given a good range of colors associated with the topography. And you can see if I click off my topography, there's really the edge of a high, high escarpment, so it's high up here, it goes down towards the coastal area, and that seems to correlate with this straight line, which I'm not sure if it answers the question as to whether this is a power line that's just going along the edge of the escarpment, or if it's a dark. Okay, so great, we've done um, regridding our data and plotting it. How about we now look at um, doing an airborne QC of the data?